Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by author, philanthropist, voice of combat sports, notorious truth teller, and world-class friend, Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Good, Ken. I just, uh, I got my hair cut so I could pick some fractions off before I got on the scale this morning. <laughs> And I hit the, yeah, that's how we did in the old days. You know, you cut the beard, you cut the hair, you shaved your legs, you, whatever you had to do to uh, make that, that fraction uh, to make weight. So I've been holding steady for the last couple of days at minus 24 pounds. And this morning I got on, I've lost 26 pounds. Nice. Congratulations. Yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's serious weight loss. And yeah. it ain't easy losing weight. Yeah, I... I got, I'm close now to the goal weight that I set for myself, which is 30 pounds. Um, but I'm like Jackie Gleason said on the Honeymooners when he was doing that contest, you know, for the $64,000 question to name that tune. I'm I'm going all the way. I'm going all the way for the jackpot. <laughs> I ain't, <laughs> I'm not stopping. I'm not stopping at 30 pounds. When you were talking about getting on the scale, you know what they would do in, uh, if you were from like West Virginia, Tennessee or Alabama, Mississippi, maybe you take out your false teeth as well. That's yeah. probably good for a few more ounces. I'm well, just kidding. I hope no, the people no, like, in the, in the South do don't jump yeah. on me. I'm just yeah. teasing. Hey, we're not trying to insult anyone. But hey, listen, uh, if if people got over what Hillary Clinton said to all the uh, people out there, half of the country out there, when, when she was running for president, undesirables and all this. Deplorables. Freaking, deplorables. Deplorables. And <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> now we're going to political gaff. Uh, well, yeah, but although she doesn't think so, she she was thinking she was saying something that uh, obviously she meant. And, if losing and, the election that, that didn't get your attention, then uh, nothing will. Yeah, that, I don't even that's think true. some of those things register with politicians. It's not just Hillary. I think it's both sides of the aisle. They'll say anything they can to get elected. There's true. no recourse. You can lie through your teeth regardless of the party and just come 100%. back the next day and, and act like you never even said it. Nah, insider insider trading, take your pick. Well, unfortunately, uh, politicians aren't too good. They are, they're not good. <laughs> politicians bad. You know, I mean, there's some good ones. Don't get me wrong. But uh, on the whole, uh, they have tainted that vocation uh, tremendously. <laughs> uh, they to really say have. The least. From, to from say what the it least. was meant to be when our founding fathers uh, first, you know, put it all together. Uh, it was meant to be regular working people coming. That's exactly right. You know? You're supposed to serve your term, hence the recess in the summer, not for a boondoggle, but to go back to your farm or whatever your occupation 100%. was, to do your job, not to be a career politician like so many just live in D.C. It was to serve a term, do your public service to the country, help it get better, and now it's like a, like a money grab. Let's get in there, wield as much influence as we can, spend our entire term trying to get reelected. Re it's not one or the uh, not one side or the other of the aisle. It's all of them. It's the same I shit. It's I disgraceful. Was, if I if I have a early Christmas wish, it would be term limits. <laughs> term limits. To say the you least, know? and we can but, do away with lobbying while we're at it. But what you just touched on, we'll finish with this. You know, uh, I remember when these tolls, these these just uh, uh, just disgusting tolls on the bridges. Um, it was promised when they first told these bridges, especially in New York, they said that once the bridge was paid for, <laughs> there would be no <laughs> more tolls. It would be free. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so much for that. They must. They probably ran for office right after that promise. You know. <laughs> you remember when uh, was it Chris Christie who got in trouble for like they were to get political revenge on one of his uh, one of his opponents? They they oh, caught, in, intentionally the yeah. caused the traffic jam. You know when you're sitting in traffic, you're like, what the f? Who is causing this? I want to kill them. <laughs> oh, don't worry about it. It's the governor. Yeah, oh, yeah. okay. Uh, I guess so. I guess, I, hope, I hope he got his opponent real real. The good. guy the guy that would told you trust me, I'll make things better. You know? <laughs> and, and vote exactly. for me. Vote. For for me yeah. a vote for me is a vote for you you know and and we're gonna and get as killed you in said, the comment goes, section as, uh, who cares uh, as you <laughs> said <laughs> who as you said it's across the board we're not picking out 100 you know I, I think that they're all they'll all do the same thing 
And, and when they get caught, they're sorry they got caught, but not, not sorry for anything else. Uh, but with that, hey, breaking news. Adrian Brona fight against Omar Figueroa is off. Adrian Brona says he's going through a uh, mental health crisis and um, needs the time away from the ring to get his mind right. Says he doesn't want to get in the ring unprepared and play with his life. I 100% agree with that. I don't think that anyone would disagree that Adrian Broner has been struggling with mental health issues for a long time. Um, I wish him the best, but I can't say that I'm surprised uh, at this uh, development. What are your thoughts, Teddy? There's a sadness to it. He acts like an idiot, a buffoon, you know, and all that. But there's a sadness to it. Nobody wants to see anybody in this kind of distress. And and to the point, you know, of... Uh, having to pull out of fights in their life being in chaos because of mental health issues. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. You know, you could see, you could see a lot of stuff coming. Um, here's my thoughts that besides being sad and by it, which I already said, I don't care who it is. I don't care. I know a lot of people don't like them, but this, this is put that aside for two seconds and it's about somebody's life. It's about somebody who's in a dangerous place right now with mental health. Uh, obviously in a in a desperate place, a bad place. And I don't wish that on any human being, first of all. And I will say this, whether it's drug addiction or whether it's, you choose, you choose whatever the thing that you're fighting with and the problems you have and when people are going through that, you can't enable them. You, you got to get to a place, and it's hard, but you got to get to a place where you actually can get them the help they need to help themselves, but that they need to have a chance to get back to a good place. And what I mean by this, and again, I we X-ray things here. We're the cat scan of these shows. We're, we're gonna go deep, and we're gonna we're gonna dive, and we're not afraid to do it. Where some people get their feelings hurt, or they'll be on one side of the tracks and say, "Oh, you shouldn't have said that." You know, we don't have for our meals. We don't shill. We say what we believe, with the evidence out there, with our own experiences to to put it forward. And what I'm saying is that f for some years now, Brona's behavior has been not so good. Suspect as best, where he's, and even physically, he's blown up in weight. He hasn't looked good in fights. You know, he, 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 um, he says terrible things on the air. And, and then, you know, you could see that, as you said, you could see something's wrong. And then what happens where well, most people would be punished for that behavior or at least there would be some accountability for that behavior, right? Right, Ken? Of course. He gets, he gets rewarded. He gets fight. I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and say, hey, does Adrian Broner have pictures on people over there at Showtime? <laughs> like every time he screws up and he looks terrible and he does this and he does that and he curses, you, you don't want to hear it, all that kind of stuff, he gets rewarded with another payday. And I think he's a big enough name, Teddy, that he, I don't they know, know but, that, but he, he's they know that he, he can get beaten by these yeah. guys like Manny Pacquiao. They almost like feed him to the Lions. They know he's going to make a mockery of himself, but it's going to bring eyeballs and maybe. people will tune maybe. in to see him lose. Yeah, I mean, but, it's, but it's maybe, like you But said, you don't have sad. to feed into that. You don't have to I agree. feed into that monster because, first of all, you can find other guys who can bring eyeballs. You don't have to find this guy with all the luggage that we're talking about, but Here's the more important point that I that I brought this up for, that it's dangerous for his life because just like a drug addict, you know, you got to cut him off. You got to cut him off and force him to get the help he needs. You can't keep enabling him. You can't. This guy needs help and he's shown. I think he's been crying for help. I'll be honest. 
Well, the thing I, is, Teddy, I, I, bet, I, I bet he's got a bunch of yes men around. And oh, if he you does. don't go along with him, he's going to shit you from the crew. His hair. And, yeah, and you're does. not going to be part of the, but a, you're not going to get a paycheck. So I, he's got the got people you. around that he's pandering to. He but wants to like, be that some... gangster style. All right. I get it. Uh, we're not new to this. We've we've heard this and seen this before. But at the end of the day, who's going to be the victim? Who's going to pay the price? Him. him. Not that. You know what it reminds me of, Teddy? It reminds me of Aaron Hernandez. You have everything. Why are you pandering to these people? Why do you have to impress the, the guy in New England? Just for the guys. people out there who don't know who he is, the, he was the very talented tight end that the New England Patriots, unbelievable, um, that that killed people, murdered people, and uh, and he was shown all kinds of you know behavior that was hidden before that you know whether you want to call it being a thug but being a gangster but he always you wanted want to, to like be that gangster personality yeah. where it's like That's you're a I'm superstar saying. you well, don't have to impress anyone you show up people are like oh my god there's adrian broner there's aaron hernandez that's enough you don't have to go in there and tell everyone how tough you are you punch faces 100%. for money on tv but here's, i don't think they could control it i think it's beyond that i think that we're talking about a sickness here Mental health is a sickness, very serious sickness. I think you're talking about that. And and again, to to just emphasize my point, that I think he's been crying for help. And I think that by giving him more fights, you haven't given him what he needs. He needs help. He needs professional help. But don't and forget, I this is boxing, Teddy. I know, this is I boxing. Know. He's I been arrested it. like four or five times no for like, excuse, I think he pistol whipped someone, punched someone else terrible, in the face. Terrible, terrible. And, and, and listen, he, a lot of people would have been in jail and a lot of people that are listening are saying, Teddy, I could give two craps about that guy because if it was me, just like you're saying, Teddy, if it was me, I'd be in jail. All right, I understand your feelings. I do. But at the end of the day, I'm detaching that. I'm just going to the human side. And you know what? This guy needs help. And instead of getting more fights, he needs help. And I put my money where my mouth was. I'm not going to name who the person is because I wouldn't do that and, and put him in that position and embarrass him, whatever. I, I wouldn't. But there was a fighter um, years ago that I was asked to train him. And as part of the deal... They, they had never heard this before, the manager. He said, gee, I never heard a trainer insist on this. But as part of the deal, I think we all knew it was the elephant in the room. It was a big you know, secret that wasn't a big secret that this fighter had some issues and problems with, you know, with substance abuse and stuff of that nature. And so I said, before I would entertain training him, I want him to go into a rehab and um the manager at the time said wow i i never would have thought that a trainer would make again would make that as part of the re of the demand to train him or part of you know what would have to happen for you to say yes and i said listen for me yeah it has to be because i can't do my job unless he's healthy and he's not healthy healthy mentally spiritually you know physically obviously but, and he can't be successful until he's healthy. I don't care how many fights he wins and how hard he punches or whatever. But um, anyway, they declined. The fight, you know, they declined. I, I kind of thought that that might be the answer. You know, I wasn't shocked. But that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm not just jumping on this issue and grandstanding, you know, and just talking about it. I I'm talking about something that I believe in, something that I have put my money where my mouth was, uh, is, and um, something that I deeply believe in, that we have to, we have a responsibility. The networks, the, the managers, the promoters, the trainers, everyone. You make money with these guys. You make money with them, then you have a response, even if it means getting fired. Yeah. Even if it means, as Ken said, that you lose your job. Yeah, you have a responsibility to speak up before it's too late. That's all. I said my piece. Yeah, and before anyone comes over the top in the comments calling us racist because it's something to do with Adrian's race. Like, uh, stop. I don't want to hear you that. Sound, you sound stupid. I don't care. I don't even want to hear We're that. I don't care if he's purple. I don't care if exactly. he has polka dots. I don't, I, I don't care if, you know... I don't care. 
I, I'm talking about a human being here. Are we, are we that messed up as a society that we're going to go those places? Are we really that messed up? Are we? Come on. I still have hope for us. <laughs> I still have hope for us, people. So, no, I'm yep. just talking about a human being. I'm talking about the gift of life. That's all I'm talking about. And I'll leave you with this. I'm a, I'm a doctor's son. And I remember I was nine years old, 10, whatever, and my father would get home late because he did house calls. He went to the, he went, he, he stayed in the office to the last person. He took care of people that had no money, that had nothing. And so he would stay there till the last person left and he would do house calls before he got home, go to the hospital to visit patients. And on this particular day, he got home at midnight. And this nine-year-old, well, to say I admired him is an understatement. I didn't know what a hero was. I just, I, I, he was my hero without knowing what the freak a hero was. And I, I, I just, you know, this was, this was a special man. And he was, I had to, I, I waited up. I wanted to see him. And so I got out of bed, I'm, I'm up, and he comes home. And he says, what are you doing up? And he said, oh, yeah, I, w I waited for you. And <laughs> I said, what are you doing so late? And he said, well, I was in the hospital. I said, what were you doing? He said, I was taking care of somebody. I said, that person must be all better. You know, nine-year-old, you know, my father, anybody, he's going to make better, right? He's, he's my hero. He's the greatest doctor in the world. So he must, you, you must have made him better, you know, something that a nine-year-old would say. And um, he said, and my father was just, to call him a straight shooter, again, an understatement. He, he just, it was right down the middle. And the, no replacement for truth. And even with a kid. You know, I mean, obviously, certain things he would not say, but I mean, for the most part, uh, he would lay it out there. And he said, "No," he said, "He's um, he's not going to get better." And I, I was thrown by that. I was really thrown by that. I was, how could my father, who stays out all night, late night? Not home with me and the rest of my family. I was just thinking about me. <laughs> Selfish. And how could he take care of somebody, sacrifice all this, and the guy's not getting better? How's that possible? And I said, then why did you stay there so late? And this is it. He said, because you don't give up on life. Now go to bed. And that's where I'm coming from, people. That's it, people. All right, let's go. Let's go to some boxing. Yeah, and we've got some uh, interesting action to discuss. Let's jump right into it with the big fight this weekend. Um, Tiafimo Lopez in action. In action against Pedro Campa. Lopez stops him in the seventh. But uh, just I have a ton of observations about this, starting with... Um, you know, Tio's coming off of some big performances. Obviously, he beat Vasily Lomachenko at the bubble at the MGM Grand, so it's hard to get a sense on, like, what the crowd would have been like. But, you know, both of those guys together at MGM, I assume they'd sell that place out. Then Tio loses to George Cambosis in a sold-out theater at MSG, so not the big room. But he has fought on the big room. He knocked out Comey, I think, on the AJ undercard, AJ Ruiz, if I'm not mistaken. But he's been on big stages now, I couldn't help but notice ESPN has him or Top Rank has him fighting in a tent in Vegas. I don't know about you, Teddy. I just found it startling. Like, this is a marquee name. I'm just glad it didn't rain real bills. hard. I'm just glad that the weather was good and it wasn't like they've a half had, a hurricane because there's hurricane season in certain areas. They've, 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 had, they've had massive floodings in Vegas, and it's just interesting to look well, that's down the true. list. That's nothing to joke about. And, no, and in serious. Kentucky, in Vegas and Kentucky, and God, our prayers go out to those people that have lost their lives and families and people that have been displaced by that it's horrible it's 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 our thoughts and prayers go to all those people yeah to say the least uh so anyway i just couldn't help but to notice like my god to go from those venues to now 
fighting in a parking lot in Vegas. It says at Resort World, but I mean, last I checked, it was marked as a parking lot in Vegas um, two weeks ago in a big tent. But I mean, even the tent, I thought it was small. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being cynical. And then listening to the You're ESPN just upset because you lost your valet uh, <laughs> pri privileges at that place, at the park, yeah. that you wanted to valet your car and you came back and was a freaking tent in the way. And you said, where am I going to park my freaking car? Come on, let's be yeah, honest. And then, and, th and then on top of that, I mean, my God, I get that ESPN has to hype this fight, but you would think that he was the second coming of Muhammad Ali, the way they were talking about him and the comeback and the take back. I mean, the, the hype. Wasn't that, Sugar Ray that Leonard, used, wasn't that Sugar Ray Leonard he just knocked out? And, <laughs> instead of a guy named Campo, instead of a guy Sugar named Campo who had been knocked out for his only loss by a guy 11, 8, and 1, it wasn't, uh, that was Sugar Ray Leonard, Tommy Hearns, I think. I mean, Campo was served up, let's face it, as a sacrificial lamb, a get back fight. Everyone expected him to get him. I think the over under was four and a half rounds at, uh, you know, with, with uh, the under being heavily favored, if I'm not mistaken. Mistaken. But point is, look, I don't have a problem with Tiafimo Lopez. I, th I think he, you know, the dad jumping in front of the camera when he won is a whole nother conversation. But the way that they were hyping him up on ESPN, and I get they got to hype their fighter, but like be responsible. And this isn't the second coming of Muhammad Ali. He's coming off of a loss. He, he didn't look that great against camp, but when he had him hurt in the end, he started showboating and like dancing around. I thought it was a bit over the top personally. And he gets him out of there in the seventh, which is what everyone expected. It was what he was supposed to do. But I'll tell you one thing. If he gets in with some of the guys he named after the fight, pro Gray, Josh Taylor, and he doesn't fix getting hit with that right hand of Campa, like he, he's not going to last very long against these top guys. I don't know, but again, this is my untrained eye. I'm dying to hear what you think about the performance. Hey, listen, Ed, I tweeted that, that he better freaking tighten up that defense for right hands because otherwise he better forget about, as you just said, those big names. Uh, you know, didn't he learn anything with Gamp Gambosis? Um, he got dropped with a freaking right. He, he ate right hands all night long and losing it. And, and Teddy, to that, to that point, I talked to Progray yesterday via text, and he said, if he's that easy to hit for Kampa, I promise you I'm going to stop him. So... Look, I mean, everyone thinks that they're the best, right? In that in that weight division, but well, you uh, have to think that you have to have that. Yeah, of course, believe in yourself. And listen, Pro Grace is just not another guy. He's a top guy. He's a former world champ, and I think he's going to be a world champ again. Um, yeah, but listen, uh, all I know is that if I could predict in our show last week that. He was going to oh, knock. Before you say that, you you actually did predict that he was going to stop him with a right hand somewhere around seven, eight, nine rounds. That's exactly what you said, and he gets him in the seventh with a right hand. So I wanted to mention that. Yeah, I didn't forget that oh, you, you right. basically predicted exactly what was going to happen. I should have called my bookie. That's what I should have done instead of just <laughs> saying it on this program. Uh, but, but Teddy, Teddy, he was a thirty-five to one under a uh, favorite. I mean, who's if you laid thirty-five hundred to make a hundred and you saw this thing through five rounds, you would be, you would not be having a fun night because at no. times it didn't look like he was going to be. Able I would to have get been having a good night because I would have bet the over. Um, <laughs> because you know I thought that was a four and a half rounds was pretty easy to yeah, take but, in hindsight. In hindsight. No, in hindsight, because that was a, that was where you had to lay money on a four and a half. People thought it was only going to go four and a half. Yeah, which tells you all you need to know about who the, the opponent was and you know who top rank pick. Look, they picked the right guy. Okay, a guy that's a game guy. He behaves like a fighter. He's experienced. He gives his all. He's a gutsy guy, but he can't break an egg, which is a good thing that he can't punch. Good thing. Because otherwise, who knows what would have happened with all the punches, especially right hands. As we already said that he hit, you know, uh, that he hit Lopez with. But having said all that, uh, he's, at the end of the day, um, he got, they did what they wanted to do. They delivered a win. Top rank, you know, protected him. Got him. And listen, other fighters, other promoters do the same damn thing. The same thing. So we're not we're not knocking them for the, doing what they do, what they've done in, for, in the history of this sport forever. Um, you bring your guy back and 
You know, you get give him the right guy. And again, he had a guy that was a game guy, a guy that was trying but couldn't hurt him. Uh, but a guy that had a terrible habit of dropping his left hand when he slips to his right, uh, which is an area where you leave yourself open, a lane for the right hand. So that's why he said he's going to get knocked out with a right hand. And he did. Um, he got it. Also, there was a jab that followed up, but it was really the right hand that did the damage for Lopez against against Camper. I somebody listen. We just finished talking about Brona. Um, there's been Brona, uh, Ryan Garcia, uh, Tyson Fury. All these guys, and there's more have dealt with mental health issues. I think they touched on it a little bit with Lopez. You know, he's going through difficult things. I don't know if they identified it as honestly and as clearly as Brona has, as Garcia at one point has, um, but they touched on it. He's going through marital problems. He uh, he just got married. Now he's not married anymore. Uh, you know, he, he's been, obviously was dealing with his, with his first loss, which is always very difficult, and all of, all of that stuff. By the way, along those lines, Teddy, uh, about the marriage, it's unfortunate and it stinks that the, you have to have these things publicized, but that marriage was a sore spot for the whole family and it's been well documented. Otherwise, I wouldn't bring it up if yes. we knew something proprietary. But they were having a beef. The parent, the family, Lopez family, wasn't. Weren't, they weren't fans of the new wife. It put such a strain on the relationship that it appears the relationship is over. And the only reason I know it is because in the one-on-one -on -one, like interview that ESPN, and I mean, they had so much shoulder content to pro hype this fight, but Kriegel asked him, how's it being a single dad? And I don't know that Tia Fimo was on board with talking about that publicly and you could see his reaction was like who said I'm a single dad like I, I'm here to talk about boxing like what are you talking about but it's just funny that they're hyping him and pumping him and then they hit him almost like in his mind you could tell with a low blow like why are you asking me about that dude I don't want to talk about my personal life but unfortunately it's become part of the story like I said because it's been so well publicized about the tension but it appears that the wife's out of the picture now it's super unfortunate for Tia Fimo. he seems like a nice kid but I, he doesn't seem to be handling this well. He hasn't looked. He didn't look good against Camboso. He didn't look great last night or Saturday. Well, give credit to Camboso. Let's not take credit away from him. Oh, oh 100%. That, that, I wasn't trying to but, demean. But listen, there's no secret that there's issues. I think that's fair. And as I said, everyone, there's so many people out there in society that are suffering with mental health. That some quietly, some too quietly. I thought it was great uh, what the UFC fighter uh, had brought up attention to it. Um, I think it was the no, was it who was it recently who uh, brought attention, saying that you you know men think that yeah, Patty the Batty, uh, Rob our producer just whispered in my ear, um, Patty the Batty. He his friend had committed suicide uh, before his last fight and he brought it up that you know it's been too long it's been taboo that men can't talk about you know depression and those kind of sensitive issues and we got to get rid of that you know uh, notion uh, if, if you have a problem talk come out and talk you know so you can get the help you need and to that point there, there's, it's out there in boxing. It's out there in, in the world and everything. Boxers are not oblivious to it. They're, they're not, you know, they're not protected from it because they're tough and they're boxers and, you know, it's the, it's the alpha male. and all. No, anyone, anyone can be touched by this depression and, you know, mental illness. So it's important that it is talked about and like we said about Brona at the top of the show it's it's important that it's dealt with before it gets to a to a worse place to a bad place so I don't know exactly what extent what level Teofimo is dealing with if, if there is mental health or is, any of those things but we know that there's turmoil in his life and we also know there's issues and we also know that ESPN I mean they I thought they overdid it they, they, they act, I mean, they, I think they tried too hard 
as you said, to make it like it was a coming back of Muhammad Ali. I mean, they, what has this guy done? He hasn't really done that much in his career yet. He beat a great fighter in Lomachenko, no doubt about it. But uh, other than that, he lost in his first title defense. But as a human being, as a human being, we want to see him okay. And they went so far, the network and the commentators, uh, um, to make this to blow it up to as i said i think they tried too hard and i mean i i started to think wait a minute did this guy go to the mountains of tibet ken you know for like a retreat for like the last couple of years and he's just coming back and he just shaved his beard like in a dressing room before he got into the ring like uh, you know to cleanse himself of of, I mean, they, they kept saying, there's the one commentator, he likes to talk a bit, but I like to talk too. Um, he kept saying, ah, oh, he's never been freer. He's never <laughs> been freer. I, I mean, I was waiting for him to sprout wings and just fly through that tent <laughs> that you that, that you so magnificently described to all audience out have, there. He wouldn't and, have had to fly too high. I think the ceiling was about 15 feet off the ring. Well, his wings would have got clipped. But uh, <laughs> I'm just saying that, boy, oh, boy, could you just, could you just drum it down a little bit? Could you control yourselves a little bit uh, about I'm going? I'm sure over? it was all they could. Do. I'm sure it was all they could do not to charge fifty bucks for pay per view. Yeah, I mean, uh, God Almighty! I guess they had to build something up because they knew they had the opponent that at the end of the day he was going to knock out. But so it was going to be anticlimactic with that. So they had to make something climatic. They had to have some drama, something to to get excited about. But I just thought they overdid the damn thing. Um, when it came to that, at the end of the day, you know, he called out Josh Taylor. I always thought Josh Taylor was overrated. So I'm, I'm, I'm not saying he can't beat Josh Taylor. I'm just saying he better improve, as you said too, uh, defensively in those areas that we just talked about, especially getting hit with right hands. Um, also, you know, he's moving up. As as is Ryan Garcia, he's leaving the lightweight division behind, and light and he's going up to to junior welterweight, uh, super lightweight, whichever way you want to call it, and he's doing that. I think he's leaving some of the really this tough fights, obviously at junior welter. I think there's a lot of tough fights at lightweight, but if that's physically better for him, so be it. Uh, as I said, he's taking the same route as as Ryan Garcia moving up. I would rather, before we talk about Josh Taylor, I know it's easier to make that fight because he's also signed with top rank. But before we go there, I'd rather see him against Ryan Garcia. And and you well, know you what, Oscar, you had Oscar front and center there, uh, allegedly. You know, and I'm going to tell you something. Matchup. I'm going to tell the people something to to bite down on, <laughs> and and to argue or or agree with me, whatever they want. I don't care, but. I'm going to tell you, I just care that I believe it, that I think right now, I think Garcia beats him. And and I'm saying this, there's still questions out there about Garcia. There's no doubt about it um, as far as being fully tested, blah, 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 blah. Um, but right now with the style of the fighters, I think that Garcia being with his long reach, um, his boxing ability, he... He could stay on the outside at range, kind of similar to what Tefimo, uh, Teofimo did against Lomachenko. Control the outside and don't let Loma really get close uh, to do his counterpunching and, and his thing that he does. I think the similar that could happen if he fought Garcia right now, that Garcia could keep him at bay on the outside with his jab and his length and his legs and pot shot him with right hands all night long. I really do. I, I, that's how I see that, people out there. Go ahead. Give us your comments. Ken's the only one who reads them anyway. If Oscar's going to make that fight or if he's even entertaining it, I would think that the performance on Saturday would uh, strengthen his belief in the fact that Garcia might be able to get it done. Yeah, I, I agree. 
I mean, uh, you could say a lot of things about De La Hoya, <laughs> you know. And, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we got to say something no, positive no, about no, someone but who's gonna, next. <laughs> but no, but I'm not going to go there. But you can also say he's a former tremendous fighter, uh, several division world champion, Olympic gold medalist. He knows something about fighting. Obviously, he knows something yep. about styles. Obviously, so yeah. I, I I agree with him. He's got to feel confident. And I'm sure he's conveying that to his guy, um, Garcia. You know, um, so I I think you know that's that's how I saw that fight. I guarantee you that fight won't be in a tent. No, I mean that. Ryan be- Garcia could fight a he could fight a broom handle and sell out the uh, one of the arenas in in L.A. I think sold yeah. out the Honda Civic Center. I mean, he's headlined some big shows. Yeah, that fight would would be big. Uh, it would be it would be a fight. I I'd, I'd be you know I'd be curious to see. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them that take place uh, that come before that for me, Ken. To be quite frank, you yeah. know. Um, but I would love to see Tank Davis and Lomachenko. They're both at lightweight right now. Uh, I would love. I would love. I really would. I really because first of all, Tank's more than just a puncher. He, he's yep. a complete fighter. But I would love to see power versus guile and technique. And again, I'm not taking anything away from Tank Davis. He's got uh, plenty of technique too. But power, pure power uh, that can get you out of there with one shot. I would love to see it against a magician, uh, a guy that disarms you, a guy that makes your power disappear. You know, I would in Lomachenko and a guy who pushes the envelope. He makes he makes your power disappear while pressing you, while being aggressive. Oh man, I, I there's a bunch of those fights I would really, really enjoy seeing. And one other thing, Sam, oh man here, give me those things over there real quick, Ken, because I can't help it. I, I want to put a, a emphasis. What's that? An exclamation point on this thing? Just, uh, just real quick. Uh, this is for the ESPN guys. Are you trying you know, to get back on the ESPN broadcast with this? You'll fit right in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, maybe this is what I've been missing. Why? Why I've been yeah. removed from my seat, guys. I've bought in. Guys, I'm on your side. I, I'm a believer now. I'm with you guys. All right, guys. Uh, <laughs> okay. All right. So. I gotta say that the the icing on the cake for that performance was uh, Teal's dad jumping in front of the camera at the end of the fight again, like he just unified like several divisions. It was just, it was. It's I don't understand right, that. Daddy, I don't, I mean, I don't but, understand well, that. But I mean, it's like icing on the cake. It's like apropos. I mean, it's it's just perfect because it fits right in with with what he is, what the father is, and what he's been and he doesn't hide it um there's just you know. part of that part of that is like you beat the guy you're supposed to beat it's not a secret it's not like oh duh, i'm not trying to insult campa but he was there to get beat he was there to get knocked out and when you do it i prefer he just like you know hand the ball back to the ref like oh, yeah no, I, no. I got paid to do this and that's what i did i'm not surprised and neither should you be and dad don't jump around we were supposed to do this chill we'll jump around when we unify all the titles again along the same lines ken the same mentality as maybe the greatest running back of all time, Jim Brown, you know, with yep. the Cleveland Browns. You know, when he used to score touchdowns uh, one after another, uh, people once asked him, I don't know if it was a writer or a broadcaster, but somebody asked him, or maybe just a fan, but it was well documented. They said, Hey Jim, how come you know you don't do the, that? You don't throw the ball down when you get in the end zone. You don't do any of those theatrics. And he said, "Because I've been there, bef- and I expect to get there again. Uh, I I've been there before many times, and I'm expecting to continue to get there. So it's not like something I have to celebrate in that kind of way. Every time I do is something I expect to do. So along the lines of that." The, the great Jim Brown and the lines of, of what you just said, um, I, I couldn't agree more, but that's not the way it is today. You know, t- t- today it's about theatrics and all that stuff, and, you know, it's not enough just to be good at whatever it is that you do. But anyway. Yep. 
I well, agree, Chris. let's let's stay with boxing and um, talk about Anthony Joshua and the rematch against Alexander Usyk. Guys, please look out Thursday. We have a fight plan coming out Thursday on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube and you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. You'll receive the notification when the episode goes live. I think it's probably 5 p.m. Eastern on Thursday, if I'm not mistaken. But if you subscribe to the channel, you'll get those notifications. This was an excellent episode. Teddy and I in the ring down at the Trinity Boxing Club. The great Martin Snow offering commentary in the background. Always super gracious in hosting us there. I mean, Peter Quillen was there. John Duddy, like legends in there training while we're recording this. So it really has, for the hardcore boxing fans, are going to love this. The casuals will love it as well. There's some, good, there's some good info and good information regarding what to look for in that fight. Especially... If you plan on placing a wager, and if you're fans of the show, I'm hoping you do it with MyBookie. Please check them out at MyBookie.ag. If you use the promo code ATLAS, they'll give you a 50% credit on your first deposit. So if you put in 2000 or 200 they'll give you 100 or 1000 respectively, whatever your appetite is for betting. Obviously, don't bet on with money that you can't afford to lose. But if you are going to bet, please consider using my bookie and use the promo code ATLAS when you make your first deposit. But with that, Teddy, before I turn it over to you to give what, to tell the fans what we should look for in that fight in the rematch, I want to read to you a, um, a tweet this morning, uh, a comment from Anthony Joshua, I assume, at one of the press conferences. Someone tweeted it out. Michael Benson tweeted it out. And I just want to read the quote to you because to me it was... I don't know, kind of out there for a comment from Anthony Joshua. He says regarding Usyk, I need adjustments to deal with the southpaw because to me, these lefties are a nightmare. I swear if Usyk was a lefty, I would have smoked him 100%. Well, what's that expression about if my aunt had bollocks, she'd be my uncle? Like, he's a lefty. Yeah, 50, you know, half the fighters or, or some percentage of the fighters are going to be lefties. So if lefties are a nightmare for you, number one, adjust make adjustments but number two i certainly wouldn't advertise that that's how you feel uh I, but again maybe i'm crazy but like you say and say all the time boxing is 75 percent mental if i'm a southpaw and i know that that guy has a nightmare and and dreads fighting lefties i'm going to emphasize that advantage and probably just throw straight left down the middle all day until he shows he cannot defend it because there must be a reason he's not liking it. he must be getting hit with those lefts down the middle or they certainly make him uncomfortable enough to say that i just found that to be very revealing and uh, a little bit too honest if i <laughs> if i'm being honest uh uh, what'd you think of the comment? And then let's segue into the breakdown of the fight. Oh, did he miss the memo that that um, Usyk's <laughs> been a softball for a long time? Um, and there's been evidence of it. There's been sightings. Ken, there's well, been Teddy, sightings. If he wasn't, Ken, if there's he wasn't been a sightings of, There's been sightings of Bigfoot and the Domino <laughs> Snowman and the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> there, there's been sightings out there that. Mr. Usyk, who was a gold medalist in the Olympics, a unified cruiserweight champion, undefeated, and now heavyweight champ, that he's a southpaw. That, that, that he should have got that memo. If he wasn't a southpaw, Joshua gets him out of there every time, seven uh, days uh, a yeah, week. Uh, so uh, maybe he comes uh, out fighting orthodox just for the heck of it to level the playing field. Maybe he'd do that no, as no, a solid fight. But for then AJ. How, come, uh, <laughs> how come he got Charles Martin out of there? Last I checked, the guy that he won the title against, a guy named Charles Martin, he's a southpaw. Ken, don't tell anyone. Ken, keep this a secret. He's a southpaw. And. And Joshua dispatched him very easily to win the title. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I I'm a little confused. I'm a For the confused. record, I love Anthony Joshua. I just thought it was a silly comment to make. Like you know, if if he was a if he was a south if he was a orthodox, you'd beat him every day. Well, I mean, I guess if he weighed 185 pounds, you could beat him every. Like there's a lot of things. If I were 10 times better as a boxer, maybe I could win a world title. Coulda, Listen, shoulda, woulda. Like, that's not what we're talking about. It wasn't the worst thing in the world. It gave us some material um, to talk about. And I would just, again, I would reiterate, um, Charles Martin was a southpaw. Now, look, Charles Martin was a better southpaw, a better fighter, a better... I get... Yeah. Yeah. That Maybe that's the problem. Maybe that Uzik's a better fighter than you that he's a it's not the southpaw just because like i said martin was the south but martin wasn't that good a fighter not not near this level 
Uzik's really a good fighter, solid fighter, mentally, physically, technically, and he's a winner. So anyway, I regress. Um, but digress, I, digress, digress. I'm sorry. I'm I'm gonna <laughs> regress in a little while. Um, I'm gonna re- <laughs> re- regress over to my to my other quarters over here. Um, this is literally the highlight of my week. Can I tell you how much I love doing this? I love bantering about fighting. The fact that people are interested in hearing us go back and forth and talking about this, it's almost too good to be true. If you're out there listening and you have something you love, if you can figure out a way to do it and people want to listen, it's a dream come true to be able to do this. So if you're thinking about doing something, I can tell you one thing. If you don't try, you definitely won't succeed. You have to take the first shot. Anyway, go ahead, Teddy. I digress. <laughs> and and the last part I'll leave about that tweet that he put out there, you know, that we're talking about right now. I would also say that maybe this tweet's going to be coming. Maybe that somebody deleted this one, thought that was better not to put it up. But I heard from good sources that he had a tweet ready to go, and he took it. To, you know, he didn't get it up there. So as I said, somebody advised that he shouldn't put this up that Joshua was going to say probably if Ruiz wasn't fat, he would have beat him. <laughs> well, that wouldn't be true because he came in fat as the day is long in the rematch and he blasted No, no, him no, I'm there. saying if Ruiz wasn't fat, Ruiz wouldn't have beat him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that, that he had problems. He would, the tweet, see, I got to read the tweet. They, uh, somebody, somebody leaked it to me. The tweet said that <laughs> the tweet from Joshua that never got up. Okay, guys? Um, probably my problem with Ruiz and my first loss and losing the title wasn't because Ruiz was better than me or much more determined than me or any of those things or because he hit me with those clean punches. It was because he was fat. And I would have smoked him except that the fat got in the way and caused all kinds of problems. All right, now I just people wanted to, forget that we people, always. I think a lot of people forget that AJ had Ruiz hurt in that fight. He dropped him. I mean, at times he looked like yeah. he was going to blast him right into the friggin' upper yeah, but, decks but in like, MSG. But like they say in the movie, the gambler. You know, when the guy went to bed and and he was ahead at halftime, or was back, and he called yeah. up the bookie the next day and said, "How much did I win?" And the guy said, "You're minus seventy G's." And he said, <laughs> "What?" And he said, "I was winning at halftime." Hey, buddy, we don't pay off at halftime. Maybe you haven't heard. Yeah. We don't pay off. Same thing. They don't. The title fight's not one round, not two rounds, not three rounds. It's 12 rounds. You got to yep. do it. So anyway, we we bring you everything out there. I hope you people appreciate it. Um, we, we even bring you stuff that you can't get anywhere else. So we found this email from Joshua to, to put it out there about the Ruiz thing. Uh, getting back to the fight, Joshua Usyk too. Listen, I like I like Usyk again uh, in this fight. Uh, I I just feel that first of all, there's a couple factors here. I think he's the most complete fighter. He's the more complete fighter uh, of the two, and I. He's much more dimensional. He could do so many more things. I even think he's got a better chin. Uh, I, I know people could say he's a smaller guy, Teddy, if he gets hit one of those right hands from... Jo- I know. I get you. But I think he's got... So far, he's shown me the better chin. Uh, he hasn't learned how to lose yet. Where Joshua has learned how to lose. And more importantly, maybe, for me, coming from my perspective as a trainer, more important than that he learned how to lose, he's accepted losing. And again, I've been down this road before with the people out there. Uh, I appreciate that Josh was a gentleman and that he didn't behave the way Wilder did after he lost, you know, in, in, in such an unsportsmanlike way after he lost, you know, the, the, the first fight he lost against Fury. I, I, that he didn't behave that way, I appreciate that. But I also appreciate that there's something to be said about a sore loser. That they, it's, it shows how important it is to them. And that I just think Joshua, again, I know that he's a gentleman. He, we appreciate that. But 
he accepts losing too easily in a in a Ruiz fight, also in a in a fight against Uzik. He just accepts it. He acts like a guy in my business that I look that made too much money, that it doesn't matter as much as it once mattered. You know, he didn't act that way when he got dropped in in the fight against Klitschko. You know, an old Klitschko, forty years old, but could still punch like hell with the right hand, and he and he got dropped in that fight, and he got up. I have a theory. He hadn't made a lot of he hadn't made all the money quite that he's made and he hasn't made all the accomplishments that he's accomplished that he's had uh he's achieved at that point. And also, you know, he he just again he it still it met it, at that point it still meant everything in the world. I'm not saying it don't mean a lot to him now, but I think it meant enough to get his backside off the floor against Klitschko. But it it didn't seem that way against Ruiz. And it just seems now that that fire, that that resilience that I saw against Klitschko, I, I just don't see it anymore. Now listen, I still see a statuesque guy that looks the part with the muscles and everything. He's in shape and, you know, he can punch with the right hand. I, what did I say a little while ago that Josh Taylor was overrated? I know a lot of the people across the pond. And, and listen, you know, you know I love you, right? And I appreciate you guys. I do. And I appreciate that you took that dartboard down in the pubs out there that had my picture on it. And you actually sent it to me and you had it signed by all the great, great uh, English fighters. Uh, So I appreciate that and I appreciate you guys. And I love crumpets. But I, I gotta say, I know you might be a little upset again with me, but Judge Taylor is overrated i think joshua was always overrated i really do i don't think he deserved to win the gold medal uh in the olympics and again i'm going to places that probably most people wouldn't go but i believe in these places i believe i'm telling the people the truth what they need to hear i called those fights in the olympics for nbc i called joshua's fight against the italian guy when he got the gold medal he didn't win that fight it was in London, by the way, the Olympics. There was no way, just like Canelo, there's no way Canelo in boxing ain't going to get a decision because he's the golden goose. There was no way Joshua wasn't getting a gold medal winning that fight in, in London. There's no way. I didn't think he won it. But, again, good right-hand puncher, statuesque guy, nice guy, right? Definitely good ambassador for the sport. I... I I don't think that again I think he's he was overrated from the beginning. I think it's showing. I think he's being exposed a little bit both in when the Ruiz fight exposed him and obviously the Uzik fight exposed him for not being quite what some of his fans believe he is or want him to be. That happens. That happens. That's my opinion. And Another X factor is the right hand. Could it still land before the night's over and he pull it out? Yeah. Yeah, it could. He punches pretty good with it. Yeah. But that aside, I see Usyk. He's mentally tougher. He's He's got the better chin, I said. He can do more things. He's more elusive. He's technically, I said it already, but he's technically better. He's hungrier. I've said that in different words. I think another X factor is that the war in Ukraine, it could go two ways. Awful, awful situation. Usyk sees his country being destroyed, his countrymen being killed in that terrible war with Russia, invasion, unprovoked invasion with Russia. He could look at it where it could help Joshua. People are saying, Teddy, what do you mean? Where he could look at things now in a, in a way that, you know what? When I see this and the death and destruction of my country and my people, it puts things in a different perspective. Boxing's not as important. 
as life. And it could change him a little bit. Or it could make him even more steeled, even more forged, even more determined. Where it puts him in a position where he is now carrying the hope of the Ukrainian people. Much like Benny Leonard, I'm, I'm, I'm reaching out for you historians right now. Benny Leonard, the great Jewish fighter in the 30s, one of the greatest lightweights of all time, when he was fighting and Jewish people were being persecuted and they would, at home, the father would say, in a Jewish household, would say, hey, hey, if Benny Leonard could do it, you can do it. If Benny Leonard could make it and overcome, you can do it. Same thing as the great, great Joe Lewis in, in, the, in the families in the, back in the 40s when, when blacks, unfortunately, was, were still being prejudiced against and abused. And thank God we've changed that. Thank God we've grown as a country in the way that we have. But I wish the rest of the world would grow that way because there's too many places in the rest of the world that still have such practices, horrible practices of, of inhumanity. But when Joe Lewis was around and he became heavyweight champ of the world and it was the biggest sport in the country, bigger than baseball, there were African-American homes, black homes that would say, hey, if Joe Lewis can do it, if he can make it, we can make it. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That's power. That's making a title stand for, for really something. And I believe that that could be the same situation here with Usyk, that with everything going on, that the hope of the people could still be attached to Usyk in the ring, that if... If we can come back, if he can do it, he represents us. He re represents our fighting spirit, our, our soul, our desire to come back, our desire to be great again. He represents us. He's us. He's in a ring fighting for us. And that's powerful. That's more powerful than anything, as I just described. And if that's the case, Joshua's got even a bigger problem. <laughs> than he had the first time. At the end of the day, there's a choice for Usyk. He fought the first time beautifully, strategic, where it was a controlled, disciplined fight, even a cautious fight, where he did everything really, really well, and he outboxed him, he frustrated him, he made a miss, he counted him, he took away his right hand for the most part, did everything, he moved the right direction, did everything. By the way, a little tip to you there, Mr. Joshua, complaining about fighting southpaws. It's called preparation. <laughs> Prepare for the southpaw, okay? Please, you you great English fans out there that I love, um, send them, send them, you know, send them a, some kind of message. You know, you guys love them. You know, send them a text if you can and say, hey, against the southpaw, it might make sense for you to step outside his lead foot and move to your left a little bit more, uh, you know, and, and continue to you know, move away from the left hand, his power punch, and get better position to use your jab by stepping outside his lead foot. But as far as Uzik goes, Uzik has a choice here. He prepared. He knows how to beat this guy. He beat him, as I said, in a very workmanlike way. He's got a choice now. He hurt him several times in that fight. He could step it up a little if he wants. Now, I know there's more risk to that. I get it. Why mess with success? I get it. Why fix it if it ain't broke? I get it. But I also get that he's more confident now having beaten him one time and that he learned a lot from that Uzik. And that maybe, maybe, maybe him and his trainer now say, hey, you know what? We could, we heard him early, third round, whatever. We heard him late, badly in the 12th round. Maybe we pick up where we left off. Don't get careless. Don't get crazy. But step it up a little bit if we can. And if we do, maybe he gets... Joshua out of there, maybe. 
And, or maybe Joshua lands the right hand. That That's what makes the fight intriguing. That's what makes boxing great. Um, that's what makes a good fight that you can make an argument both ways. Again, at the end of the day, for all you people out there, as Ken said, bet only bet responsibly if you bet at all. Uh, I'm liking I'm liking Mr. Usyk again. And the line, Teddy, is minus 215 on Usyk, plus 150 on AJ. Teddy likes laying the wood with Usyk. Over under 10.5, Teddy, minus 155 on the over, plus money on the under, 10.5 rounds. What are you taking? I'm going under. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. I, I'm going under. I'm, I'm, I, I, know, I know what my eyes told me. He heard him in the 12th. I know that the fighter Usyk knows he heard him. He's more confident than ever. Maybe more determined, even though he's a determined son of a gun anyway, than ever because of what's going on in the Ukraine with his people over there. Um, I'm saying that I don't know if he picks up exactly where he left off and it's a 13th round, so to speak, like like we used to say in boxing. But I think that when he hurts him again with that left hand, which it sounds from the tweet of Joshua, he hasn't learned a lot. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. Or at least and, he's and, thinking about it. Oh, he's thinking about it. But it also tells me something more important. 75% of this is, is this game is, is mental. It tells me he's not in the best mental place to be talking about those things, almost making excuses, uh, 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 you know, just before the fight. You know, very, I mean, a, <laughs> less than a week before the fight, Ken. That's not what you want to hear your fighters saying. It's really not. It's really nope. not because you want him in a confident me- and mentally in a good place. Uh, anyway, it sounds like he's not in the greatest place, but I go under for all the reasons that I, I like it. I said taking the over in boxing is like taking the uh, under in a football game. I just can't bring myself to do it, even when the odds suggest that maybe you should. I like rooting for points. I like rooting for stoppages in fights. So there you have it. Check it out. MyBookie.ag. Use the promo code ATLAS. And Teddy, before we talk UFC, just want to take a minute to give a quick shout out to today's sponsors. Number one, we got Feel Free. You guys know I've been talking about this for the last several weeks. It's a Botanic Tonic from BotanicTonics.com. You can use the promo code ATLAS to save 40% off your first purchase. Feel Free. It's a Kava-based Botanic drink i drink these things before races before big workouts sometimes i'll drink one before the show it's supposed to create a relaxing euphoric feeling i feel like it gives me a little bit of energy and focus but i love them and again at 40 percent off give it a try see what you think give us some feedback in the comments let us know what you think and of course per usual athletic greens always on board with us Check them out at athleticgreens.com slash atlas. They'll give you 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. You guys have heard me say this for the last several years. I love Athletic Greens. I take it with me everywhere I go. I never, ever miss a day. Sometimes when I'm deep in training, honestly, I'll take two servings, one in the morning, either right before or right after a workout, and I'll take one right before dinner. If nothing else, it ensures that I'm getting all the right fruits and vegetable servings that I need in my diet, especially when you're in training and running yourself low. Athletic Greens has 75 whole food sourced ingredients backed by science, backed by doctors. Go on the website. You can read all about it. Athleticgreens.com slash Atlas. 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. That's a huge value. Those travel packs are unbelievable super convenient with that teddy let's talk ufc great show last uh last saturday this past how saturday often do we San say Diego. that with ufc how often do we say uh, that every week because well, they put on about. like 10 10 to 15 fights and you can always find something for everyone you're a the consistency practicer. we're not knocking boxing boxing is my life okay guys that's why i'm here because of boxing but all i'm saying is the consistency factor has to really you can't if you're going to be honest you can't argue it it's on the side of ufc consistently week to week they they get some that aren't great of not too many but once in a while but for the most part wow the consistency consistency factor for the product of competitive fights is on the side of ufc over boxing it is. Uh, you know, it is. Boxing will throw you a bone. 
don't get me wrong. You know, you 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 get a real special one. And if the big names, and we're looking forward to Golovkin and Canelo, which we just interviewed um, Canelo's trainer, Jonathan Banks, by the way, uh, another week or so. I, I'm not sure when Rob's going to put it up, but not too long. You're going to see the interview with Jonathan Banks. I would really, really, really recommend you listen to it. It's tremendous. Uh, Banks tells, well, he's he's just an honest guy, tremendous trainer. He was a tremendous fighter. He he comes from you know he he was he was taught by the legendary Emmanuel Stewart. So he comes from that cloth, uh, and he talks. From the he talks from honestly in Detroit. Yeah, he talks honestly about things that not all trainers would divulge. And, and I was actually honest. surprised at how candid he was. He gave a lot of good insight and color as to what they're thinking. And, uh, yeah, like you said, Teddy, you don't want to miss this, especially if you're going to plan on watching that fight and visiting my bookie. But um, with that, Teddy, co Saturday night, instant classic. Oh, my God, what a, uh, what a battle. If you like fighting, you will love this fight. It was Nate Lewander from Tennessee, hometown boy, and uh, against David Onama. And my God, the action was back and forth. My whole family was engaged in this fight. Everyone was screaming and yelling at one minute. It looked like Onama's going to stop him. Then here comes Nate back and forth throwing bombs. Oh, it was so entertaining. In the end, Nate gets the win. Nate Lewander gets, gets the win, gets the majority decision. And he was magic on the mic. It just... It's so funny and entertaining on the microphone. It was just, like I said, instant classic. How'd you like that one? How we pronounce it? Land, I have Landwer. What is it? Land? Landwer. 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 And Anuma, yeah. Listen, to your point, um, I was in my office, which I'm in right now, doing some work for this show. I do work. I work. I put work in for this show you guys, <laughs> and um, that's why we ask you to please show your love, appreciation, uh, if you have it, uh, by, you know, subscribing, and um, and we appreciate all of you. We're at 268,000 uh, subscribers, right, over 50 million views, but we want, we want more. We want more. We know there's more out there, so if you want us to keep doing this, uh, do your thing. Subscribe. Pass the word. And I was in my office getting ready. I didn't know the fight had started yet. And all of a sudden, I hear screaming from the living room. My son, my son's home from Vegas for a week. And I hear him screaming, oh, wow, whoa, <laughs> wow, whoa. And I'm like, oh, man, I, gotta, I, I better get in there. And I got in there. And wow, wow. Um, Land was, you said, Land were, uh, he was a huge underdog and pulled off the upset. Just, just, I tweeted. I, I tweeted, I'm going to read one of my tweets. I know Rob's going to put some up, but it kind of tells you everything. I, I just watched Gaddy Ward, Ali Frazier, Castillo Corrales all wrapped in one and in three rounds. I mean, that's what it was. That was my initial way of describing it. What a back and forth fight. First round, Onama pounds Landwer. Then before the round ends, Landwer comes back <laughs> and 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 catches At one point, him. Teddy, in the first round, it looked like Landwer was unconscious. He got smashed and went down. I was like, oh, he's out. And then he somehow held on. Almost and, like and when you hear some fighters say, I got knocked back into consciousness. I think that happens in the UFC. The guy looks like he's out for a minute, then he gets punched in the face again, and it wakes him up, and he's like, oh, I'm back in it. Almost like when Incredible. Fury got dropped in that first fight in the 12th round by, by Wilder with the right hand, and he laid there like he'd been shot. And, <laughs> and, and then all of a sudden, at the last second, like at the count of nine, he gets up. So second round, Lam and as Ken just said, and as I said, uh, just really, Onama was just pounding him until the end of the round. And then in the second round, Lamar continues where he left off. And he evens the fight at 1-1 by just, again, doing to Onama what Onama had been doing to him. 
Head number it also eight. looked like Onama's gas tank went from full and full speed ahead to dead empty. It looked like he couldn't even keep his hands. Well, he up. poured he poured a lot out in that first round, and yep. and sometimes you know, sometimes you you can you know you you want to get that second wind, and they all train for it, and they the great ones get it, they get it. But he he did. You could argue he punched himself out a little bit, but in the second round, as I said. Uh, it, it's one nothing going into the second, and then oh, he hits Onama with everything, including the kitchen sink, and just what shins, what shins and heart by both, and the heart and the will. Again, Ken, I talk about this a lot with UFC and with boxing when appropriate. All these warriors, these titans, but again, it was on display uh, by these guys, and and then the third round. Uh, both guys taking turns pounding each other with the edge to Lenwer, Lenwer, and and although Onama was incredible, especially and he came on at the end, but it was just an extraordinary exhibition. I I thought Lenwer won two to one, but it was a extraordinary exhibition, an example to us all of just heart and resiliency. Um, it was incredible how Onama continued to escape. This is something that I want to touch on too. How he continued, Ken, to escape all kinds of holds while they were on the floor. Whether it was a guillotine or, you know, whatever they were. You know, I'm not Joe Rogan. I'm not DC. You know, I'm not Bisbane to give you the technical exactness of what the hold should be called. But I know fighting. And... Boy, oh boy, the way he escaped some of those holes, he was like an eel, really, slipping out of them. And I think that part of, they were sweating profusely, profusely. I think that part of the way they were sweating, because as you said, they emptied their tanks, the way they were sweating, the they that he was so, Onama was so wet, and slippery <laughs> that it really helped him. It helped him slip out of some of those holds. I really, I mean, obviously it was his ability to escape and to stay calm in an uncalm environment and to think when most people wouldn't think and to not give up. But I think being sweaty helped. Um, helped him escape in some of those areas, some of those times. Look, Ken, in the end, and all the people out there listening, in the end, it was their will that took them to places that others just won't go sometimes. And, you know, and I've, I've said on this program before, and I've said on ESPN, I've said throughout my life in, in boxing, uh, these, are, these are special people. Uh, they find light in dark places. And again, they teach us that, yeah, there are other rooms that are in our house. You know, I, I call the body, the spirit, the the mind of us, you know, our, our physical capsule. I, I call it a house sometimes. I refer to it as a house. And just like if you had a mansion, and like you do, Ken, and sometimes <laughs> you you don't get, you have a golf cart to drive around. Not everyone has a golf cart. And sometimes you don't get to go to all the rooms. And what I always say about these guys in my analogy is that they open the door to rooms that sometimes we don't open. That sometimes in our life, we just don't open. We we don't know we can open them. We forget there's a room there. And that's what makes them so special, I believe, is that they open those rooms and they go in. And... They teach us. They teach us that there's always a room that hasn't been opened if you're willing to go find it and to go in it. Uh, if the fighting wasn't enough, Ken, I just made a note to myself. Land were, you know, you always want that X factor. You want to be an entertainer. We talked about it earlier, right? Um, you know, to make that extra money. First, it starts with the fight. You got to be able to fight. But... um. 
And also, I want to say, once again, the matchmaking was tremendous. 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 Uh, give, uh, I've said it before. I'll say it again. Dana, I'm not being frivolous with your money. You're very generous. But uh, give one of those $50,000 bonuses to your matchmaker that you give out to the fights of the night, which I want to see you keep giving out. But he deserves one too. But while they were exhausted, Ken, as you said, and um, in that in that last round, I think it was the last round, talking about the entertainment part of it, that Landwer started. If 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 Onama was on the floor, he let him. He walked away from him, and then he gestured to the crowd. You know, Ken, he gestured to the crowd with his arms, and it was like a scene out of the movie with Russell Crowe in The Gladiator, when when he lets his guy live. You know, he lets the guy live and then he goes around to the crowd and he just says, have you not been entertained? <laughs> you know, Patty the Batty did that too. But have you not been entertained? Are you not entertained? And he, he threw that in there and he deserved the right to throw that in there to, you know, to go to that place because of both of their performances, both of their heart. You know, both of their wills, as I just said. So he, you know, he, he obviously wants to, he knew it was the moment to get attention and he made the most of it. And I applaud both guys. Um, and I'll finish with this. When they were both, as you touched on, both exhausted, both were exhausted, but Onama first. Obviously, they just kept finding energy as they needed to. And we all talk about now, you know, the cost of gas, right? And all that's, you know, at the pump and everything else. So I had to make an analogy here where when I watched it, I said to myself, both these guys find gas stations in the desert uh, <laughs> when, there's, when there's nothing around. And they truly, I know we use this as a, as a cliche, when we say, you got to dig, you got to dig, you got to dig deep. These guys dug deep, really deep, and deep, en deep enough to find oil or gas for their tanks. And they did. If you dig deep enough, people out there, in whatever you do, you can strike oil in your own way. So that's my story for that fight. It was tremendous, and uh, and the main event was was good. But that was boy, what an opening act, you know, before the main event. Wow, I mean, yep. And with that main event, uh, Cheeto Vera stops Dominic Cruz. Dominic Cruz uh, having a rough go of it lately. I feel like, and I like Dominic Cruz a lot, Teddy. But I feel like he's getting very chinny. It reminds me a little bit of Roy Jones in that as he got older. He still had some of the quickness, but once you're like a step, once you lose a step of quickness and with age, as soon as he gets hit on the chin, he was rattled several times from those shots, whereas he was hitting Vera with shots that weren't even affecting Vera. Um, and I just think that that comes with the age. And looking at um, looking at Dominic's last record, he's got the loss to um, Cheeto Vera. He's coming off two wins in a row. Prior to that, he had two losses for titles against Cody Garbrandt and Henry Cejudo. Uh, knockout against Cejudo. Decision against Garbrandt. But, uh, yeah, it's tough to see these older fighters when they get to that level. And he's now at that these are the fights he needs to win if he wants to be in that title contention. I thought the fight was really entertaining. I thought Dominic Cruz looked good in moments, but Cheeto Vera just seemed to have control of the fight from my perspective. And it seemed like just a matter of time. And eventually he caught him with that unbelievable kick to the face. He got Cruz to dip to his right um, Vera's left. And right when he did, he kind of walked right into that set. He Vera set that kick up beautifully. Um, what'd you think? Listen, you to your point, you know, obviously, Ken, uh, old cars, you know, they don't drive as well when they put a lot of miles on the old Domino. There's kinks, there's, you know, noises come out of the engine that weren't there before. You know, you might have to change the oil more often. Uh, you can't go on a long trip the way you used to be able. 
I mean, that's that's part of the deal. If it's the deal with old cars, it's definitely the deal with older bodies. No different. You know, it, you get shop worn. Uh, miles get on that old domino. You're not as uh, you're not as resilient. Yeah, you, uh, you know whether you want to call it more chinny, whatever you want to call it. When those not miles pile up, it 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 leads to damage. It leads to something, and quite often, that's what it leads to. Having said that, Kuzo, former champion, like you said, Fear is the only guy to beat who I think is probably the future superstar, O'Malley, although O'Malley did injure his leg in that fight. But I could see how he could beat talented people the way he does because Cruz, Cruz's, his patience, his deliberateness, his, wow, his technique, his, you know, his technique is, is tremendous. But his mentality He's so controlled. He's so freaking disciplined. He doesn't waste nothing. Like I often used to say on ESPN, and I say here, your your grandmother would have loved him at a dinner table because you know you didn't have to throw anything in the garbage. He didn't he didn't waste nothing. He don't waste a thing. He don't throw unless he's in position. You know, like the like the great Japanese champion in a way. You know, unless he's in position, he ain't throwing a punch. You know, and he's always balanced. He's always in position. And Cruz's style was not an easy style, even at the later age where he is. Uh, And it won him the first two rounds. Second round was closer. But it won him the first two rounds because that style of moving, stopping, punching, in, out, you know, one minute he's moving, next minute he pop, 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 pop. Next minute he's charging at you, blitzing you like a Pacquiao used to get away with with his speed. He's quick, Cruz. That style is hard. And, and it won him the first two rounds. But then Cruz got figured out by Vera. And Vera did figure him out. And the way to figure him out, I tweeted it too. I think I was kind of on the button with these. He... Sometimes I'm not, but I was kind of on a button with these, where I tweeted that Vera is not going to outspeed him. He's got to time him. And I said, there's an opportunity to time Cruz as he comes in. A little reckless, like Pacquiao. He got timed a couple times. Marquez timed him. Um, And I thought that there was an opportunity to time him coming in and going out. In other words, catch him going, catch him going, catch him coming, catch him going. And he did. First, he he caught him coming. Uh, He caught him, Vera caught him coming in, he counted him and nailed him. And I believe he dropped him, hurt him. I think he dropped him first uh, and for the first time in a fight. And then in a later round, he caught him going out. He used the jab to set the table, and then he caught him with, he ate, if you will, with the with the right hand, um, with the power punch. So he caught him coming in, Vera, and he caught him going out. Just really smart, cerebral. Um, again, good timing, good patience, good control. Uh, didn't panic. Stayed calm, even though he lost the first two rounds. Uh, so I, like I said, he timed him coming in. I, I made him note uh, in the second round and dropped him. Then he caught him going out uh, with a jab in the right hand. And I, I believe it was the third round. So I had it two rounds to one for Cruz uh, going into the fourth. And then, as you said, Ken, but again, it wasn't just a kick. We That's the obvious. But he understood that he could catch him going out. And this time, Vera caught him going out with a kick instead of a punch. And obviously put an end to it. And did something we kind of, we didn't want to be reminded of this, Ken. Pretty graphic. You know, I hope you guys ate already. But reminded us of what we touched on last week when we showed broken noses. 
We had a, yeah, people, we had a show. If you didn't see it, go watch it. We had a show on broken noses. Dislodged, displaced noses. Pretty bad. Um, where the nose at the end of the fight is not where it was at the beginning of the fight. It's in a different locale. And that seemed to happen to Cruz, where I don't know if it was verified, but it looked like that kick, again, dislodged his, <laughs> dislocated his nose, moved his nose from one side of his face to the other side of his face and broke it. It immediately was bleeding. He went down. It looked like a broken nose anyway. Again, I don't know if we got verification yet, but it really did look like what we talked about last week, Ken, with those noses being moved around the face a little bit uh, when they're not supposed to be moved around the face. So at the end of the day, uh, like I said, I, I just thought that I, I if if I could be critiquing of Vera, not critical, but constructively critical in any way, I would say that early in the fight when he was losing those rounds, I thought that he should have used a jab to the chest of Cruz just to control and stabilize. He wasn't really jabbing. Just to control and stabilize him on the outside. Um, but at the end of the day, I was very, very, very impressed with the steadiness and patience of Vera, the accuracy of his punches, and of course that kick. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was just, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I think this guy is a dangerous uh I think he's a dangerous fight for anybody. Yep, I agree. And with that, we've got the um we've got a big fight coming up this weekend. Kamaru Usman in action taking on Leon Edwards. Um what are you looking for in this one? I know that this is gonna be a uh this is a good fight. Uh a lot of anticipation around this one. Yeah. A hundred percent. First of all, I like both these guys, the way they conduct themselves in and out of the ring. Uh, not just with their talent, but just that they get down to business and they behave like champions outside of where they perform like champions. Uh, we've had Edwards on our ad, so I, I really have, a, I like him a lot. He was a real gentleman, smart guy, and... He's in the same position as our friend Dustin Poirier. Now, that's going to get the attention of some people. They're going to say, what do you mean, Ted? This is a rematch where he fought Usman, I think it was seven years ago. I think it was 2015. He lost a three-round decision. And Edwards wasn't the same guy, obviously, physically or mentally, or maturity. He has matured physically and mentally since then. Edwards has. He's improved. Now, here's the problem. Usman has improved, too. He hasn't stayed status quo. He's gotten better. <laughs> so that, that's, that's what's interesting here. But much like Dustin Poirier, a friend who comes on the show a lot, who, when he fought McGregor the first time, he wasn't the guy he became the second time. You know, he was much younger, not as mature, not as good, quite frankly. And six years later, he gets the rematch, very similar to this. And he, I even said it before the fight. I said, you people out there think it's going to be the same. You're wrong. This is a different man. Forget about different fighter. That's the key word. This is a different man. And he's grown up. And Dustin showed that in the rematch when, of course, he knocked out uh, McGregor. I think that you have similarities in this fight. Now, this is no knock. I already said how much I admire Edwards, but I think in some ways, just for the lack of a better way to get to the point quick, he's a poorer man's version of Usman. And a no knock. How can you knock? Because Usman's very special. I think Edwards is special. He's just not quite as physical, quite as good in those areas from a physical standpoint i think he's very similar i think it's a mirror fight i think it, it's like shadow boxing i think these guys are looking at each other in some ways in the mirror 
where they're tremendously similar. They're workmanlike. They're blue-collar type guys. Their personalities are similar. They're very serious, technically very solid. They've become, become well-rounded. And not, nothing fancy, no frills. You know, they're more steak than they are sizzle. They are just solid, blue-collar type guys that are very talented. I get it. But solid blue collar type guys that go about their business uh, in a very, very, very similar way. Very similar way. Um, I think, as I said, where can I pick a little separation? Usman might have to bet a chin. Edwards got badly hurt late in that fight with the great Nate Diaz. Um, but. Edwards still has a good chin. That don't mean he don't have one. Usman might have a little bit. Usman, as I started this conversation, might just be a little bit physically more durable. A little bit, just a little thicker in some of those physical areas, if that makes sense to the people out there. Um, at the end of the day, it's kind of hard to go against Usman, not just because of the talent, his supreme confidence, he truly doesn't believe anyone could beat him. And it's hard to beat a guy like that. It's not impossible. Like they said in Godfather 2, they asked, uh, they were looking to kill Hyman Roth and said, can we do it? Is it impossible? Not, and the guy said, when Michael asked him, uh, what do you think? He said, not impossible. Difficult. Not impossible. It's going to be difficult to beat Usman. Not impossible. But it is, and Rob, get that up, by the way. People love those those movie things, you know. You can't go wrong with the freaking Godfather. Um, one or two. Very, very seldom that a sequel is up to par with the original. But, again, just that I, I, think, I think at the end of the day, Usman, just a little bit, I think it's going to be very competitive. I think it's going to be very good. I think it's going to be very interesting. I think some chess. I think some chess is going to play out as far as strategy. You know, as far as, again, the mind, the thinking, the cerebral part of it, which all great fighters have the capacity to go there. Uh, but at the end of the day, yeah, Edwards wants to revenge that fight. Edwards is better. And he'll do everything to win this fight. And as I said, I think it'll be competitive, very competitive. But Teddy, for the you, for the guys at my bookie, my bookie dot ag, use the promo code Atlas, fifty percent deposit, fifty percent credit on your first deposit. For the folks who are going to visit my bookie, we've got Leon Edwards at a plus two eighty and Kamaru Usman at minus three seventy, and you got the over under over four and a half rounds minus one seventy, under four and a half plus one thirty five. I'm going with the over. I just said it. I think it's going to be competitive. I think it's going to be a chess match in some areas of the fight. Uh, if I had to bet, it's not too much delay. It's a lot to lay, but it's not uh, It's not as crazy as some, some fights are to lay. I probably would lay it. But at the end of the day, I'd probably be more prone to not lay as much and go with the over. And as I said... I, I don't discount or figure out in any way Edwards, but a guy who's got that supreme confidence that just really f just thinks that he can't get beat is a hard guy to... It's a hard guy to beat with all the talent that he's got. And Edwards, yeah, he wants revenge. Yeah, he's a lot better now. Uh, at the end of the day, I have to, again... Go with Usman. And over our friend, uh, who we really admire a lot. I admire both guys. I, I admire most of these fighters. But we admire Edwards a lot. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Looking forward to this one. As usual, great great weekend of action with the, um, with the heavyweight fight. Usyk, AJ, 
And then you've got over on a pay-per-view, you've got two pay-per-view fights, AJ and Usyk, and then over on the ESPN pay-per-view with Camaro and Leon Edwards headlining that event from Salt Lake City. I think first time, maybe first time UFC's been in Salt Lake, beautiful city. Uh, but lots to, lots to uh, look forward to this weekend, Teddy. And um, I'm looking forward to breaking down all the action, obviously, on Monday. And of course, please, guys, Thursday, tune in for the fight for the fight plan aj versus Usyk 2 uh, on youtube please subscribe to the show you'll get the notification letting you know when it's up and ready i believe 5 p.m eastern on thursday this coming and um you got anything else teddy before we say goodbye to everyone yeah one thing i just want to go back just for a second go back to what we were talking about at the top about the teofimo you know comeback fight right and how the commentators might have been just a little bit like the movie again i'll use a movie uh de niro and goodfellas when he said uh yeah, when de niro said you insulted him a little bit yeah 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 you insulted him a little bit um the commentators might have been a little bit over the top you know with their homerism that's a new word it's okay. <laughs> Their homerism uh, for the, obviously, the house fighter, the guy they wanted to win, uh, Teofimo. But you know what bothered me even more, Ken, and nobody talked about this, and I have to mention it because I do pride ourselves that we mention things other people just don't. Matter of fact, I don't read the comments, but my son sent me a couple. That's the only time I see them, or if you send me them. Uh, I don't have room for all yours because you're sent all 42,000. But um, <laughs> uh, 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 God bless you. you. You you look at everything. And and I appreciate it. But my son did say that in a fight with Conlon in Ireland, I think it was last week, where we were the only place to mention that there were two knockdowns by the ref, you know, counted by the ref in that fight in Ireland, that weren't knockdowns, they were slips. That it was either very bad ref and or it was homerism, you know, protecting the home guy and the, the house fighter. I saw something that bothered me the other night, again, along those lines. It's one thing for the commentators to, to shill, but it's another thing when a referee does it. And Tony, Tony Weeks, a very experienced referee, obviously, um, he he did something that I, I wish I didn't see it, where, and nobody talked about it, where there were, early in the fight, there was a moment where they came, they came to, on the inside, I don't know if it was, uh, where they came inside close and went into a clinch or about to go into, I don't remember, but they got in real close quarters. And, Teo Fimo actually gestured. He looked at the ref because he was in that position where the referee was looking at him. And he gestured, break this. And Tony Week, he followed orders. I, it really bothered me. I, I wish someone would have, but of course they wouldn't mention it. But I wish, they, they might have mentioned if it was the other way around and it happened to the house fighter. But I God, I wish it would have been. If I was broadcasting, well, that's why I'm not broadcasting. But I, I would have mentioned it. I, I would have just said, "Hey, wait a minute, guys. You can't have a referee taking orders from a fighter." And it sure looked like the referee just obeyed the orders, the gesture, the body language of Lopez, where he said, "Break us, get him out of here, come in here," and. He did. And I'm not saying that it changed the outcome of the fight because it didn't, but it's not right. It's not right. And see, that's the problem with our sport. There's no oversight at all. There's not, no police. Nobody at that tower looking down and watching what's going on. NFL, golf, basketball, baseball. There's always somebody that if they saw something like that that was unsavory, that, that had a look of impropriety, you damn sure it would be dealt with. Damn sure. Immediately. 
Why? Because you got to save the credibility of the game. You have to protect the credibility of the game. I mean, that's why Pete Rose, who the greatest hitter maybe of all time, uh, at least the most hit, he's the, he's the, the hit king. And you like him, you hate him. He gambled, I get it. But that's why he's not in the Hall of Fame. And that guy deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. But that's why he's not in the Hall of Fame. Because, you know, he uh, he he gambled. And you can't let people that gamble because it attacks the integrity of the game. So, I, yep. all right, I get it. But boxing, it seems like nothing Nothing attacks the integrity of Bob, but it does. But nobody protects it. Nobody there to protect the sport. You know, nobody there to, to say, hey, this can't be allowed because you will damage the reputation of a great sport. I had to say that. I hope everybody has a great week. I hope you do, Ken, your lovely family. Um... Sam, uh, who does the filming here, Sam Rivera, it does a great job with the videos in his own right. And, of course, Rob Moore, who does the producing. All of you, all of your families, God bless. Thank you, Teddy, and thanks, everyone, for being with us. See you Thursday with the fight plan for AJ Usyk, number two, and we'll see you next Monday to break down all the action. Thanks for being with us. Please subscribe and like the show. We appreciate you.